are so many questions in life to which there appear to be no answers. For example, there was a young man in our church and he fell in love with a beautiful young woman. And he asked me to do the ceremony for them and I did. Two months later, he had a car crash and he died. And his young wife of two months asked me, why? Why did he have to die? I worked with this very good young man, known him all of his life. He looked for a long time for the perfect wife, and he found her. And they were married, and they became pregnant with my third grandchild. But we miscarried. And uh, my grandchild died. Why? Why did my grandchild have to die? On September the 11th, 2001, some people hijacked a jet airliner and flew it into the Twin Towers in New York City. And then another jet airliner was hijacked and they flew it into the Twin Towers. New York City. Another jet airliner was hijacked and it was flown into the Pentagon in DC. Another jet airliner was hijacked and crashed into a field in Pennsylvania. Nearly 3,000 people died. Why did those people have to die? December the 26, 2004, Category 9 earthquake took place in the Indian Ocean, sent a tsunami, 276,000 people were killed. Why did those people have to die? There was a 17-year-old girl who was going to a Bible study at church. At the same time, there was a man who had had too much to drink, and he was driving. He hit the girl head on. It was his third time to be intoxicated in DUI. It was her first time to die. Why did she have to die? There's so many questions in life that just don't have clean, simple answers. Well, why is there so much pain? Why is there so much divorce? Why is there so much abuse? Why do so many people die young? Do you ever ask those kinds of questions? I do. I ask those kinds of questions. There are just many things I don't understand. Why does God answer some prayers, but not other prayers? Why do terrible things happen? Why? Have you ever felt like Jesus felt that God was just a long ways away? Maybe you felt like he felt that day on his cross. And he asked God, why?
They crucified Jesus on what we call Good Friday. It wasn't a good day for Jesus. In fact, it was the worst day of his life. A confidant named Judas had betrayed him. A uh, people that he trusted fleed from him. His disciples ran. He was turned over to authorities, and authorities questioned him and interrogated him, slapped him. Authorities turned him over to the Gentiles, to the, to the Romans, and the Romans, the Romans beat him, mocked him, scourged his back. He was bleeding profusely, stuck a crown of thorns in his head. Hit him with sticks. Wasn't a good day. Made him drag a cross down the street. Impaled him onto that cross. Lifted that cross. Hung him there in the sun to die. A death of suffocation. It wasn't a good day. It's the worst day of his life. You know, you've had days similar to that, of course, not to that extent. Or maybe you know people that have. What had Jesus ever done to deserve such a day? Nothing. And you're going to run into times in life, and some of you already have, and others of us will, where there are no real reasons, and any reason that anyone would give you is so shallow and so inadequate, it just doesn't a- answer the question, why? They crucified Jesus at 9 o'clock in the morning. The Bible says it was the third hour. The day began at sunrise. It would have been about 6 o'clock this time of the year. It would have, then the third hour would have been around nine o'clock. They took him and they crucified him and hung him on the cross at 9 a.m. in the morning. And he hung there until about 3 p.m. For six hours he hung there. And in those six hours the Bible says that he gave seven statements. Seven things he said. The first thing he said is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Isn't it amazing in a state like that that you're still operating in love and forgiveness? Second thing he said, spoken to the, to the thief who was dying beside him. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Still forgiving, still giving people hope in a dying state. Third thing he said, he spoke to his mother and a, and a friend. He said... Mama, behold your son, and son, behold your mama. Taking care of Mary. Taking care of love. Fourth thing he said was, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Fourth thing he said. Fifth thing he said is, I thirst. He was still, he was God, but he was still man. Sixth thing he said. It's finished. Still doing the will of God. Seventh thing he said. His father, into your hands commend I my spirit. It's on the fourth thing that I want to concentrate. It's on the fourth thing that only happened once in the life of Jesus that it's recorded. That he asked God, why? I want to read that to you, if you will. If you have your Bibles, it's in the book of St. Matthew, chapter 27, verse 45 and 46. It will also be on the side screens for you. And here's what it says. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness. The word in the Greek means obscurity. It was so dark 
Nothing was clear. Darkness came over the land. It's the Greek word gi, gay, spelled, it's pronounced G-A-Y, but it's spelled G-E. And what it means is the region. The region in which Jesus abided became dark. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible says that darkness covered the gi, the land, the region. And it covered the land from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. It was obscure. The sixth hour would have been noon, high noon. The ninth hour would have been three in the afternoon. The time when it should have been the brightest, it was the darkest. You know, there are no scientific reasons as to why it was dark. I've heard people try to say that it was an eclipse, but it wasn't an eclipse. It was the time of the equinox. The sun and the, earth were, the, sun and the moon were on opposite sides of the earth. No scientific, no logical reason why it got dark. You know, there's times in our lives where there is no logical reason why we experience darkness. No logical reason at all. We haven't done anything. All of a sudden, though, life gets obscure. We're groping around trying to find a way out. No reason. It's just dark. I, uh was reading and studying for this, and I found a quote from Jack Hayford in a book that he had written. It's called, How to Live Through a Bad Day. And what Hayford says is, In life's darkest hours, there are usually no human beings with adequate answers. Have you ever had a time in your life where no one could give you an adequate answer? Why God? Just as there was no adequate answer as to why it got dark that day, people experience dark times in their lives, and there are just no adequate answers. Sometimes in life, you see, stuff happens. Um, why do babies die? They sin? Why do people who commit to love one another till death do us part? end up hating and crushing each other? Why do people get diseases? Why do good people have bad things happen to them? Why? Maybe you've asked that. Maybe you will ask that. Maybe you have loved ones who have asked you that. You see, if you don't understand something about it, it will pull you away from God. I have watched Christians backslide because of why. And so what I want to do over the next few minutes is look at this a little bit. Try to help us all get beyond the obvious and penetrate into the obscure, but yet with some purpose. The first thing that I want to do before I really get into looking at the why and trying to find some purpose and reason in there is I want to give you a caution, or actually three cautions. Uh, Christians and good-meaning people are going to come to you with basically shallow and inadequate answers for very deep and complex situations. One of the things that they'll tell you is... Uh, you know, there must be sin in your life. <laughs> uh, there is a book in the Bible about a man named Job. It's a very long book. And Job went through a very dark time. He had a bad day. <laughs> His, uh, he lost children to death. Marital problems was happening. Uh, he lost all his money. He was attacked physically. And he had some good friends. And they came to him 
And they told Job basically this, you've got secret sin in your life. That's why this is happening. Well, if you've read the book, you know that wasn't the case, right? Let me ask you this. Jesus was having a bad day. Was it because he had secret sin in his life? You need to answer that. Because when well-meaning people, sometimes preachers, come to you and say, this is happening because you have sin. Listen, if you buy into that, you're going to pull away from God. Because if you think because you mess up one time, God's going to make bad things happen to you, you're not going to draw near to God. You're going to flee away from Him. Sin has consequences. It does, so don't mishear what I'm saying. Sin does have consequences, but every bad thing that happens is not sin-related. It wasn't to Job, and it wasn't to Jesus. Another thing that well-meaning, but yet shallow people will tell you is that you don't have enough faith. Now, Faith can change situations. Faith can turn bad things around. We need to stay in faith, remain in faith, and walk in faith when we're going through tough times. But let's ask that question again. Was it because Jesus didn't have faith that he was having a bad day? We walk in faith, we live in faith, we do what we're supposed to do, but every bad situation that you are people that you know and love go through is not because they don't have faith. And another thing that well-meaning people will tell you is that it's the devil. The devil is attacking. Let's make sure we get it right. The devil does attack. The devil desires to destroy you. And he will if he can. Was it the devil attacking Job? Was it the devil attacking Jesus? Was it? But before we give a shallow answer to a very in-depth question, was it just the devil attacking Job, or did God have a much bigger plan than Job saw, or even that Jesus so, it was the devil. And it may well be the devil attacking you. But beyond the attack, there's something more. Let me read you a scripture from the, the Apostle Paul wrote. It was, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7 and 8. Paul trying to help us here understand things. He says this, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Folks, there are things we just don't understand yet. They're hidden wisdom. It hasn't been made clear to us yet. It's obscure. There are answers, but we just don't know them yet. There are answers for every single situation that you or I go through. There are solutions. But sometimes we just don't know what they are yet. It's hidden wisdom. Which God ordained before the world. Why? Unto our glory. For our good. Hidden wisdom for our good. So that our lives can be great which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There is hidden wisdom of God that is to bring us glory, bring us good. Was it a demonic attack on Jesus, trying to kill Jesus' life? According to that verse, did the princes of the air crucify him? But was it also wisdom? Yes, it was demonic attack, but it was also the wisdom of God. 
Can, can we relate those two? Can a demonic attack still be God's wisdom? Was it with Jesus? Was it with Job? See, you may be well going through or will go through or have gone through a demonic attack. But at the same time, it was God's wisdom. What we've got to learn how to do as believers is look beyond the obvious, the demonic attack. And see beyond it into the wisdom of God. Look past it and see what God's up to. God's up to something. Was he up to something with Jesus on that cross? Was it for our glory? Oh, hallelujah. But yet Jesus still asked why. You can ask why. Jesus asked why. It's okay to ask God why. See, it's the wisdom of God, but yet in a way that we cannot yet understand. The Bible tells us that we see, know, speak, talk, live in part. Paul, again, trying to help us understand this stuff tries to help us understand that there are answers to every situation that we go through. There are answers. But our minds are not yet to the place where we can quite process them and formulate them. Even the mind of Jesus was having difficulty processing that cross experience. Why have you forsaken me? So Paul, helping us, says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Let's read that. When I was a child, or when I was immature, I talked, baby talk, I talked like a child. I talked immaturely. I thought like a child. My thoughts were immature thoughts. If you have children, you know how this works. I reasoned, I processed, I formulated like a child. When I became a man, mature, or woman, I put childish ways behind me. Now, would you please say that back to me? Now... We see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then, would you say then back to me? Then we shall see face to face. Paul is dividing our understanding and our ability to process and our ability to grasp and formulate into now and then. As to being a child and maturing into an adult. There is a tremendous thought process Knowledge process, difference of how we think when we're children versus how we think when we're adults. What Paul is equating that to is your spiritual life as well. You don't know it all now. We see a part. There is a now. But hallelujah, there is a then. You see in this? Let me start again with a now and then. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror... Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then, shall, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I will know answers to life just as well as God knows me. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Paul divides understanding into now and then. Now we only have a part. But as we mature, 
And as we hang tight in faith, hope, and love, then our ability to mature, formulate, and process information also matures, and we all of a sudden know. Now and then. Our knowledge level is related to our maturity level. And our maturity level is related to faith, hope, and love, and the ability to remain in it. Paul says there are answers, but if you really want to get to the answers, you've got to remain in faith, hope, and love. And so many people don't. When they go through tough times, they start hating people. When they go through tough times, they get faithless. Instead of getting faithful, they slip back. Instead of having hope, they get despair. If we're going through tough times, we've got to remain in faith and hope and love if we're going to find the solution to that tough time. I'll give you a, an example. How many of you have ever taken an infant, one of your children, to a doctor's office for a uh, vaccination? Would you raise your hand if this ever happened to you? Good. You relate to this then. Um, I only had to witness this a couple of times, and it was plenty for me. Judy did most of that stuff. But the time I went, I will never forget. My children trusted me then as much as they trust me now, and maybe even more. I was daddy. And I took them to the doctor's office for the vaccination and for the checkup. And we go into the room, and uh, in the room, the doctor, in the room are these little toys and trinkets where the children are playing, and, and everything's fine for a little while. And then the doctor comes in, uh, and the nurse, and they do the examination, and everything's going well until it becomes shot time. And usually the nurse, usually the doctor gets out of there, but the, they, they get the syringe, and they stick that syringe into the vial, and began to suck into the syringe the medication for the vaccination. <laughs> now everybody in the room understands what's happening. We understand why it's happening. We understand what's going on here. We understand that this is for not only the child's health, but also that they will not contract a, a deadly disease, but, but also we know that it's for their posterity, that, that they won't continue to contract something and then it be handed down to their generations. And, and we also know that it's, it's to keep them from becoming contaminated so that they will contaminate other, other children and other people. So we know it's not only for their good, but it's for the good of humanity. And so the nurse with the syringe begins heading for the child the infant, this one-year-old child, and begins aiming either at the thigh or the bottom. How many of you remember that moment? <laughs> Faith remembers it. <laughs> How did you feel knowing that that needle was about to be jabbed into your baby? I looked away. I did not want to see that needle be stuck into my child. I could have stopped it. But I didn't. Why? <laughs> For my child's glory my child's good. I knew. But did that infant know? And so I looked away and then I heard the scream. And I looked back. And my child is not fighting with the nurse who has stuck that needle. My child is looking at me with tears and a face of pain and question, my daddy, my daddy, why? Yeah. 
How do I communicate with that one-year-old mind? This is for your good. <laughs> this is really going to make you healthier. This is really going to help you from avoiding bad things and carrying bad things to other people. How do you relate to that mind? Now uh, my children understand it. Now my children take their children through the same process. Then, or which was now at that time, they didn't understand it. Then, which is now, <laughs> they do understand it. See, understanding and wisdom is divided into now and then. It was this way with Jesus and the Father. Can you imagine how Father felt looking at his son on that cross? And a Roman soldier walks up with a spear and shoves that spear through his side, his lung, and through his heart. How do you think he felt? He looked away. And as he looked away, it got dark. He could have stopped it. Could he? Jesus said he could have sent six legions of angels. But he didn't. Why? Let me read you this passage in, uh, again in Matthew 27. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. Darkness came over all the land. You know, I've heard a, a lot of thoughts. I've heard many thoughts. That's all of that I'm going to read. I've heard many thoughts about that situation as to why Jesus, why it got dark and why God had forsaken him. But I have my reasons. I have my thoughts too. You see, if you can relate to that where you turned your head when your child was about to get stuck, a lot of, a lot of people had come to Golgotha that day just to watch the show. And I think that God says, my son's not going to be a spectacle. I'm turning the lights off. And in the last hour of his baby, he was not a spectacle. We only see in part the Jews only saw in part. What they saw was a heretic of which they were ridding from their land, from Judaism. The disciples saw in part. The disciples saw someone for which they had sold out, sold everything, and followed, forsaken it all. And now he is dead. They had done it for nothing. We today still see that in part. We still are yet to comprehend the whole picture of it. Right. Jesus saw in part. Why have you forsaken me? Had Father forsaken him? Had, had Father forsaken him? But that's what he saw. God had a plan. And his plan was for the glory of Jesus. His plan was for our glory. And we read about it in John 3, 16. And it says, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him, you don't have to worry about death anymore. You don't have to worry about sin anymore because now you have eternal life. That's the plan. That's the why. Jesus understands that now. But at the time when it was happening, when it was now, then, <laughs> he didn't. It's going to come around wherever you, whatever that you're going through. If you will just remain in faith and hope and love, even in your cross experiences, just as he did, then you're going to experience the understanding of it. You will understand the why. I, uh, I've heard that, you know, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've heard a lot of uh, theologians and Bible teachers talk about why God forsook it. And it goes basically something like this, is, is that God put all the sin on Jesus. And then he couldn't look at it. Because he can't look at sin. Heard that? That's inadequate. That's shallow. God, all through the Bible, looks at sin. He went down to check out Sodom and Gomorrah himself. He knows your sin. That's inadequate. Let me read you the verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says this, And God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. What happened here? God made Jesus sin. He didn't just put the sin on him. Jesus became sin. He made him sin for us. For us. So that in him we might become right with God. The righteousness of God. See, Jesus wasn't a goat. Like in the Old Testament, they would take a scapegoat and they would put their hands on this scapegoat and confess all the sins of the nation and then lead this goat out into the wilderness in that the goat would take the sin into the wilderness. Jesus didn't take your sin into the wilderness. Your sin isn't out there hiding somewhere waiting to jump on you at some given point when you walk by. Your sin is dead. Listen, listen. That was, that was sin bleeding. That was sin being speared. That was sin being scourged. That was sin being beaten. That was sin on that cross. That was sin that died. That was sin that died. Oh, hallelujah. God didn't just run off your sin. God killed your sin. And now everybody who receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is free from the power of sin. Sin no longer has dominion over you. It's dead. He made him sin. He crucified sin. He crucified your sin. That's what that's all about. That's the why. Now let me tell you a secret. When you're going through your times, your Good Fridays, he's crucifying your sin. <laughs> Jesus <clears throat> took care of sin. I read a story. It's about a father and a child, a son. The boy's about seven years old. Sitting up in the front seat with dad in the car. And they're driving down a road in the springtime. Windows down. Just enjoying each other's company. 
and a bee, a wasp, flies in the window. And the child is deathly allergic to bee stings. And so he begins to panic when he sees this wasp buzzing the automobile. He begins to panic. And his dad knows, too, the allergic reaction that his son would have, and they're out in the country. And if this bee were to sting him, it could really be bad. It could be fatal. And so what the dad did was grab the bee and held it and squeezed the bee. Thought the bee was dead. He opened his hand, and the bee flew out. And the boy again began to go into horror. And he says, son, son, calm down, it's okay. Look at my hand. And in the palm of his hand was the stinger. He can't hurt you anymore. Amen. That is what Jesus did for you and me. Sin can't hurt you anymore. Jesus took the sting. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? Stuck in Jesus. And for everybody that comes to Jesus now, no longer does sin have dominion over you. Your sin is dead. You are right with God. That's the plan. That's the big plan. That's the answer to the why. So, Delbert, what are you saying? Um, whenever I run into something that I can't understand, uh, I just say, oh, well, I just don't have the mentality yet to understand that. And let it go with that? No, not exactly. <laughs> what I'm saying is you've got to remain in faith, hope, and love. Jesus is on that cross remaining in faith, hope, and love. You've got to remain in faith, hope, and love. Walk in faith. Listen, you've got to pray. When you're going through tough times, it's not a time to stop praying. It's a time to remain in faith. Remain in hope. Remain in love. It's a time to begin doing what you know to do. Speak to that mountain. Command it to be plucked up and cast into the sea, and it shall obey you. Remain in faith. Don't start slipping back from faith. Remain faithful. Don't start getting faithless. Don't start coming to church less and less because there's something going on in your life that you don't understand. Go to church more. Remain. Accelerate in your faith. Hope. Remain in your hope. What is God's plan for your life? What is His revealed will for your life? What has He called you to do? Then remain in it. Don't get hopeless. Don't get depressed. Accelerate in your hope. Hope is your anchor. And love. You know, a lot of times when we go through tough times, usually other people are involved in it, and we want to blame other people. And we'll let hate and bitterness and bad words come out of our mouths. Don't do that. Remain in love. If you will remain in faith and hope and love, you will get the solution to the dilemma for which you're facing. Remain there. Accelerate there. I watch so many believers backslide during tough times. Become faithless, loveless, hopeless. No. Now abideth these three. Faith. Hope and love. And if you'll remain there, you will find your solution. You will have the answer to your why. I want to close with this illustration. I want you to look at this word for me and tell me what you see. Do you see no where? Or do you see now here. A lot of times when you go through tough times, you'll say God is nowhere. My God, my God, why 
Have you forsaken me? What I'm wanting us to see today is get beyond the obvious, beyond the situation, beyond the shallow, and get to the obscure. Go on beyond that so that you can see the now here. Had God forsaken Job? Had God forsaken Jesus? Has God ever, ever, ever forsaken you? No. And he never will. And I don't care what you're going through. He is always now here. Always. It's a perspective. It's a maturity. It's remaining in faith and hope and love. And if you will, you will always find the answers to your why. Amen? That's the word of the Lord. Would you stand with me and bow your heads, please?